The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Uh, it looks like we have around 30 attendees right now. Uh, my name is Sam Kobrick from Mineral. I think we're going to give everyone just uh, another minute or so to trickle in, and then I'll get started. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, good evening to everyone joining from India and good morning to everyone joining from North America. Uh, my name is Sam Kobrick. I'm a data scientist and researcher at the US National Renewable Energy Laboratory or NREL. Uh, I also am joined by my colleague Karatash Das, who works in the modeling group here at NREL. And then we also have uh, Saptak Gosh, who is a uh, modeler and analyst at CSTEP uh, which is a NGO based out of Bangalore, um, and he is, will be taking some of the uh, later presentation today. Uh, this is the third webinar in a series that NREL is putting on in the India Modeling Spotlight. Uh, we are looking specifically at tools that NREL and our partners are developing to help uh, utilities and power system modelers in India uh, do their job better and understand maybe some of the challenges or, or opportunities that renewables pose for their specific distribution systems, uh, as well as the, the country's transmission network. Um, so today we are looking at uh, DGEN and CREST, which is DGEN is a tool being developed by NREL and CREST is a tool developed by CSTEP. And both are trying to answer the question of uh, better studying and analyzing rooftop solar adoption. Uh, so this is distributed solar adoption on rooftops or, or even ground mount systems, um, but is, is behind the meter, uh, as we would typically say, it is uh, attached at the distribution node um, or, or to the distribution system, um, and it is not a typical utility scale system. So to start here, there we go. Um, to start, we, we just like asking kind of the big question of how you currently are modeling distributed solar adoption. And when we, we start working with utilities or other partnerships, we typically see it's more or less just, you know, continuing a line, seeing, seeing previous uh, levels of uh, cumulative distributed solar adoption and then just trying to continue that trend. And uh, that might be adequate modeling for a lot of use cases. But we are expecting distributed solar adoption to look a lot more like a kind of a hockey stick or just exponential growth that rises really quickly uh, as the, the technology cost uh, decreases and as you know, uh, knowledge diffuses and, and people become more aware of the, the potential savings as well as the, the benefits of adopting rooftop solar. We think particularly in India, there's a lot of opportunity for rooftop solar, which we'll get to in a little bit. But also from just a modeling standpoint and from a, a power sector planning standpoint, it's difficult to know if you're just doing some simple linear regression modeling or, or continuing a trend line for your modeling, knowing precisely who, when, and where distributed PV will be adopted. We think there's a lot of uh, questions that you need granular answers for related to distributed photovoltaic solar. Uh, for instance, if you have concern about, concerns about specific distribution feeder carrying capacity uh, or potential backflow, um, also knowing if, if uh, distribution and adoption of rooftop solar will be equitable across your customer base. Uh, for instance, will access to low and moderate income communities uh, or will it, will it be more clustered in more affluent centers? Uh, and also when, we, as I was saying earlier, we, we typically expect rooftop solar adoption to look more like a, a hockey stick than a, a, a straight line, meaning it will kind of shoot up exponentially as technology costs continue to decline. So knowing when that potentially could happen 
um, is, is pretty important for playing so it doesn't get you by surprise. So why forecast uh, distributed PV in India? Well, we think, and this might be familiar to a, a lot of the callers today, but we think that the, the situation and the, um, the on the ground situation is, is really uh, uh, friendly for distributed PV for, for three main reasons. Uh, the first is that there's a really uh, great policy regime coming down. Um, obviously the national uh, renewable energy target of 175 gigawatts. Uh, which has a carve out or a, a set aside section of 40 gigawatts of distributed rooftop PV. So currently there's only about 5.5 gigawatts based on estimates by PV Magazine, uh, as well as Bloomberg New Energy Finance, uh, only around 5.5 gigawatts of that 40 gigawatts, but there's still a tremendous amount of subsidies, tax credits, as well as supportive net metering policies uh, that are really widespread. For instance, you know, here in the US or in a lot of places of Europe, we're starting to see net metering um, phase out or, or net metering uh, become less prevalent, uh, well, while in most discoms in India, net metering is still widely available. Uh, the second reason why we see a lot of potential for distributed PV in India is just the resource potential. India offers really high uh, relative resource, solar resource potential. We're talking around 20% capacity utilization factor for a lot of fixed roof systems. Um, so just the, the relative sunniness you get in India is, is comparable from a, a fixed roof system to what you would require for a lot of uh, utility scale tracking systems here in the US, uh, which, which have a, a, tr a significantly higher capital expenditure. So the resource potential, just high capacity factors, uh, it makes a lot of sense to, to be utilizing solar energy, um, especially for residences that can offset um, part of their bill. And then the third there is just unlocking lower finance rates. So there, there are relatively high retail tariffs in India and, and the case for uh, rooftop distributed photovoltaics then, especially with uh, friendly net metering regimes is, is a lot clearer from a business perspective. Um, even with relatively high financing rates and loan rates from, loan rates from a bank uh, with enough technical potential modeling and other uh, modeling that NREL and, and CSTEP and others can help with, we're, we're hoping we can unlock lower financing rates by being able to uh, take results to banks and, and show them that, you know, this is a technically viable system that will be able to pay itself off in a, a reasonable timeline. So uh, we're talking again today about two different models, DGEN, which is NREL's model, and then CREST, which is CSEP's model. And so these two models uh, have been kind of developed side by side to each other. They aren't necessarily interlinked, but they do share a lot of data. And we think it's useful to present them together to, to show the kind of two different ways that they, they solve uh, different issues. So DGEN is a, a statistically representative agent-based model. So what that means is we simulate uh, we simulate buildings and customers and rooftops in India. These aren't actually real buildings and rooftops, but they're based on statistical representations of what we expect actual buildings to look like. And then DGEN walks through the technical, economic, and adoption potential. So to unpack those three words a little bit, technical potential is looking at what's technically feasible to put on a rooftop, meaning how much rooftop area do you have that's developable um, across a, an entire district or state or the entire country. Uh, and, and from that, you know, if we installed rooftop PV on every available square meter, how much rooftop PV capacity and generation would we have? Economic then is subsetting that, it's filtering it down to look at uh, uh, what of that technical potential is actually economic to install, meaning it would pay itself off over a, a reasonable uh, system lifetime and, and at a, a, a feasible low rate. And then adoption potential is kind of the unique perspective that DGEN takes. We use some advanced customer adoption modeling techniques to uh, model market diffusion. And so what I mean by that is if your neighbor adopts rooftop PV, you are more likely to adopt rooftop PV because you, you talk to them and you learn from their experience. And so we simulate that, that network effect through uh, some diffusion modeling that I'll get into later. So what DGEN does is provides a really detailed um, uh, adoption forecast, uh, forecast at the state or district level. But for India, at least, we aren't modeling individual customers in the rooftops. So it's useful to try out in various sensitivities or cost or policy scenarios and compare them to each other. Uh, that's where DGEN really shines, being able to model what rooftop PV adoption looks like in a low cost versus a mid cost scenario and compare them. 
So moving over to Crest uh, or C-Step's rooftop evaluation for solar tool, um, which C-Step out of Bangalore has been developing uh, at first for BESCOM, but hoping to expand to other utilities. Uh, they are looking specifically using very advanced LIDAR data, so rooftop scans from airplanes, and then attaching that to actual customer uh, consumption data that they get from the utility. So being able to show individual customers exactly what the technical potential on their roof is, and then also what the economic benefit or the business case of adopting solar is in terms of the internal rate of return and payback period, et cetera. So this is modeling for a, an, an actual real customer what solar would do for them. So while DGEN takes much more of a high level kind of policy perspective or scenario based perspective of comparing scenarios and understanding um, how a, a change or how a policymaker pulling a lever might affect adoption over the long run, Crest provides a lot more actionable information to actual customers. Um, but they're both doing the same thing, more or less, uh, which is modeling uh, customer adoption of, of distributed or rooftop PV. So questions DGEN can help answer here include, you know, what a change in net metering policy might do, how sensitive to wholesale market prices uh, rooftop PV could do, changes to cross subsidization in India is a big one that, that we discuss a lot. You know, if subsidies or tariffs change um, and, and tariffs increase or decrease uh, for residential or commercial or agricultural, uh, how does that affect adoption of DPV? Does business case change for various sectors? Uh, also then looking at integrating renewables, uh, something we work with utilities a lot is for their integrated resource planning or for plans that they have to submit to a, a regulator to the state, um, trying to show them an, a, an adoption forecast that they can use with their planning. And then finally looking at storage, in DGEN we're starting to be able to look at a storage or electric vehicles impact adoption. For instance, if you adopt an electric vehicle and you're able to charge it midday uh, from your solar panels, are you more likely or, or, or less likely to adopt solar? And the questions Crest can help answer, and again, Sapta Gosh, uh, who, who works on the Crest tool, will be speaking later, but it's, it's really great at looking at what the exact right system size is for, for the customer, so customers can really understand the business potential of their roof, um, what the technical potential you know, for an entire city is, not a country necessarily uh, or a state, but just for, for the city, what technical potential is and which feeders, um, given that if you had feeder level mappings from a utility, being able to show exactly what technical or economic potential at the feeder level is, which could be really useful for distribution system planning. Um, okay, so a little bit about the DGEN model here. We model a DGEN using five steps. Uh, the first is generating agents. Um, so I mentioned that DGEN is a statistical based model. Um, we have two different ways we can do this, which we'll get into in a second. The second is applying technical or siting restrictions. So associating a rooftop size with each agent and being able to understand then what the, the technical um, restrictions are related to that rooftop in terms of its tilt, its azimuth, what the quality of the resource that the rooftop provides is. The third then is providing uh, or performing economic calculations. So we actually use 8760s of data, or that's uh, hourly data from an entire year of resource potential as well as demand or consumption to look on an hourly basis over the entire system lifetime on um, what the detailed cash flow looks like. So incorporating project costs, retail rates, incentives, and, and, and any net metering or net billing policies. Uh, we then calculate uh, the market share using a vast diffusion uh, type diffusion model, which I'll get into a little bit. Then finally, we conduct some analysis. So to run through these steps in a little bit more detail, first, we, uh, we, we start by generating agents, which involves a statistical sampling. So we gather quite a bit of data about what the underlying geography looks like, uh, what the, the capacity, uh, what the technical potential is, what historical adoption has looked like, what consumption patterns look like. And then we use all this to, to draw kind of a, a giant pool that we can sample agents from. So we're not pulling out actual houses or actual businesses that we, we are modeling uh, adoption for. Rather, we're, we're modeling um, what averages and standard deviations look like. So we have representative agents but agents usually signify more than one customer. So uh, an agent is multiple customers, um, and then we can simulate what percentage of that agent adopts in a given year. 
The other way we can do this, which we've done in some of our more advanced projects in Los Angeles and Orlando here in the US, is uh, simulating individual buildings using rooftop LiDAR data and, uh, and detailed customer data we get from utility, which is a lot more similar to what Crest is doing. Um, however, we're not currently doing that for India. So the second step then, as I mentioned, was applying technical constraints. So for each agent, we look at their sector, we look at their rooftop, and we try and narrow down from, from the overall uh, total availability of the roof to how much could actually reasonably be developed um, from a technical perspective. So as I mentioned, we use 8760 solar data, uh, and then we also apply constraints such as you know, roof, rooftop uh, size, any interconnection limits posed by the utility, um, as well as looking at you know, how angle and azimuth affect uh, affect the technical potential and the generation of this system. Oops, skipped a slide there. Okay, there we go. Uh, yeah, the third step is applying economic constraints. So we conduct that uh, cash flow analysis to really parse down from the total technical potential, you know, as you see in the pyramid here, down to the economic potential. And so economic potential is we use uh, a payback period metric, um, which we surveyed people um, here in the US. We conducted a survey and we're looking to conduct a survey in India comparably, um, but we surveyed asking at various payback periods how comfortable people are at uh, adopting solar uh, or rooftop PV. And so from that, we construct kind of a curve of what your payback period is or the number of years uh, that the system needs to be operable to pay itself off. Um, and from that, we're then able to understand from a cash flow perspective which systems are economic and which aren't. We also can test other configurations like battery storage or EVs here. Uh, step four here is calculating the market share. And this is where it gets really interesting from a modeling perspective. Um, the figure here is a vast diffusion curve, which is used in a lot of customer adoption modeling for tons of technologies from you know, TVs to washing machines, you know, if Samsung or Apple releases a new phone, they typically will, will run or have, have some people run a vast diffusion model for them to understand how quickly people will adopt it. The idea behind the vast diffusion model simply is that you have two variables, a P and a Q, which P signifies uh, early adopters. You know, we throw that term around once in a while, an early adopter or an innovator. And then Q signifies uh, later adopters or imitators. So the idea is that you have a small number of people within society who are willing to experiment and try something new. So for instance, adopt solar, and then their neighbors who are influenced by Q or that imitation factor, see that and then adopt it. When you put that together and, and run this equation, you get a really beautiful looking S curve here, like we've shown. And uh, I don't have the figure here, but uh, a lot of other technologies, as I mentioned, from the refrigerator to the washing machine to the television, you see this S-shaped curve. Um, where people are initially hesitant to adopt, but then you you see uh, a, a spike in adoption, almost like hockey stick, we call it, and then it levels out as you reach an upper limit of, of market saturation. So we run this within DGEN, just because a customer is economic to adopt rooftop PV, we don't necessarily assume that they will do so. We, we model it as a, as a fast diffusion curve. Finally, just looking at analysis and some of the outputs that we typically get from DGEN, these include capacity um, by the geography, capacity factors, payback periods, which we find really significant for uh, uh, summarizing how likely a customer is to adopt from an economic perspective, uh, as well as net present value and the number of adopters in terms of count uh, by sector. Um, so we have a pretty advanced team here at NREL of data scientists and visualization uh, geeks that are happy to put together you know, slide decks and graphics. And I think with that, I'm going to hand it over to Peritosh Das, who is my colleague here, and can walk through some of the US-specific results for DGEN as a case study um, before we're able to get more into uh, some of the India work we're working on. Uh, Peritosh, I think you should keep our mask if, if you want to take it away. Cool. Thanks, Sam, and good morning and good evening back in folks back in India. And my name is Pratosh Das, and I'm a research engineer working at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's a lot to unpack that Sam presented. It's a complex model, so there's, I'm pretty sure there would be a lot of questions. So please get the questions going in the chat box, in the, in the webinar chat box over there, so, so that we can 
answer those uh, in the later half of this uh, webinar. Uh, I'll just move ahead and give you some aspects of the US version and what are the US results that have come out from this particular model. So just as a peek for what are the results that you can expect from the India modeling coming through, I think we are planning to come out with results pretty soon, some, sometime and in September. So these results would be kind of a peak for, for the results that are coming through. So moving ahead, let's see. Cool, okay, that moved. A little bit of lag, but okay, that seems good. <laughs> so basically, uh, one of our annual products that Enroll comes out for the US is the standard scenarios report or the standard scenarios outlook. It's basically a good range of 20 to 30 forward looking scenarios for the electricity power sector in the US and how different power scenarios would change uh, adoption of different technologies. It incorporates our capacity expansion modeling uh, known as REEDS, the REEDS model. I think that's one of the webinars that has happened earlier. And that also includes the DGN portion of it, which includes the distributed uh, portion, the behind the meter PV adoption portion of it, which we are responsible. And these results are primarily relevant for transmission level forecast used by utilities or power planners for their integrated resource planning or the like big picture studies. If, how, if we have a change of policy, how does that affect adoption of distributed PV? or a particular technology's adoption in, in, in 20 years, in 30 years, so long-term, long big picture aspects. So it's, as Sam was mentioning this, uh, we go to a detail level, so our results can be disaggregated on, on a county level for the US, but on an India aspect, I think we are trying to disaggregate them on a state level, but with incorporation of more and more data, I think we are trying, our ultimate aim is to go into a district level or more final resolution if we have relevant data for that. But right now it's on a state level and we can disaggregate more up and down depending on, on, on the scenarios uh, we are modeling. Uh, I think some of, one of the uh, graphs that you see on, on, the, on the lower front is the renewable energy generation for different uh, scenarios. So all the, all the line charts are, line graphs are for different scenarios that we modeled. I think the black one is the reference case for different years. I think for 2019, uh, we are coming like 3,200 or terawatt hours for the whole of US. So we have a detailed report out every year. I think the 2020 uh, work is currently underway. So we'll be out pretty soon for that portion of the analysis. Let's move to the next one. As Sam was mentioning about uh, the potential outputs that we can expect from, from, from the modeling aspect of it, uh, some of it is the adoption, uh, how much capacity, how much uh, distributed PV capacity do you can expect in different scenarios for a different range of years from 2030 to 2050. We, at least the model it's configured right now goes till 2050, but it can, it, it can be more uh, configured to like smaller scenarios, like detailed one, five year, 10 year analysis periods. Like if we have particular goals or utilities have particular goals that they want to look into more like a deep dive. Uh, I think the lower uh, graph is basically on the payback period. So how does payback period gets affected how with, uh, ad with adoption of distributed PV? So as you can see, so here we have disaggregated it on by sectors, so residential, commercial, and industrial. And then we have uh, further classification by PV cost. So if PV cost, with the low PV cost, as you can see, like it comes down even lower. So the payback period sometimes comes down. For residential sector is close to eight to eight to nine years by 2050. For certain, th this is an, I think this work is for a particular utility in Montana. So this is not US specific and it would differ for state by state, depending on different policies that they have, different incentives that each state puts out or different uh, electricity tariffs or retail rates that might be more favorable for adoption of behind the meter PV. So this is just a, to give you a flavor of the different uh, outputs that we can expect from the modeling, from the India specific modeling that's currently underway. 
moving on. Okay. Uh, we talked about what are the research questions that we're answering right now, but this gives you an example of other various research applications that we have used DGen with, and we are more interested in, in answering these research questions going forward. Uh, some of those are like, what are the infrastructure needs that distribution grids would need to incorporate like higher and higher level of DER deployment? As we move ahead with our different goals for renewable energy targets, a distributed energy PV, PV and storage and other resources are gonna come in quickly, but is our infrastructure ready enough to incorporate that? If it's not, like what are the upgrade costs that is associated with that to incorporate those? So doing a cost benefit analysis of the infrastructure needs that would be needed to get to get closer to the goals or to to get ready for those goals. The second one would be like how we, we try to research is like how retail electricity prices influence uh, DR adoption. Uh, they play a very good handy role for for adoption of distributed PV. So some of the states there might be very high electricity prices. Some might have low electricity prices depending on where they are, the region they are, and there are particular incentives that are super favorable for, for distributed PV, say net metering, or there's a variance of a particular net metering or net billing aspect of it. So depending on those, like how does that figure out in the overall picture of our goals? Is there a particular sweet point that a particular utility or a particular utility planner thinks that maybe does this particular incentive help in reaching that particular goal or does it not? So that's something that we try to incorporate and see, does, does a particular incentive have an actual effect that it's actually intended to, or does it not achieve those intended uh, targets? Uh, the third one I think uh, is like, what's the impact of electrifying an economy? So as more and more electrification happens, what effect does it have on, on adoption of these newer technologies? Uh, primarily rooftop PV, roof, uh, behind the meter storage, and how, how can we cohesively integrate uh, the electrification part of it and also the, the adoption of these technologies. And as I was mentioning about like, we are more interested in also studying the synergy between DER resources and transmission scale resources. So that's uh, would be a combination of capacity expansion modeling, uh, coherently working with uh, the behind the meter PV of it. So generally the case is we, in all our planning models, we don't usually include uh, behind the meter PV because it's more a customer centric aspect. It's not just an cost optimization aspect because people take decisions differently. Uh, something that works out for a utility, primary on a cost basis might not work out for individual customers. Where they are located, what's their preference for a particular technology is, is does it work? Uh, for my roof or not. So it's very difficult to capture those intricacies in a capacity expansion model. Uh, so that's where we want to look into the synergies. I think we have done a good job with the US uh, looking into those uh, very interactively, uh, changes of uh, in capacity expansion modeling with uh, the behind the meter PV modeling. And that's something that we are trying to would love to look in for, for the US, for the India specific analysis. Uh, I, I think this is something that I was uh, touching a little bit earlier that uh, the DGEN does well, that it kinds of tries to size the system intelligently depending on the tariff structure, depending on the load profile and the roof area that a particular building might have so that it maximizes the net present value for that particular customer or that sector of customers. As you can see, like uh, on the right-hand side, there's a combination of uh, sizes, PV sizes that we can size to uh, in collaboration with if it's tariff constrained or if it's roof constrained. So the ideal sweet point is that green dot, uh, that optimal sizing ratio where like my roof might not have a full, I don't have, I might not have the full roof to like incorporate 100% of my load, but what's that sweet spot that gives me the, the positive, it maximizes my net present value and also compensates some of my load and which has a positive payback period and a lower payback period and that works economically for me. So I don't want to oversize my PV system so that it's uneconomical. 
but I also don't want to undersize if I have a bigger roof uh, to so that I don't get the best value of money for, for the PV system that I'm putting out. And these PV system costs play an important role. I think that's what we're trying to model for India, depending on uh, different labor costs, just not the capital cost, but the OMN cost, ONM cost, the capital cost, and also the labor costs that might differ from state to state and, and countries to countries too, which we are which we are seeing from our work with different other countries. Uh, finally, my last slide, I think, uh, India is one of our fourth uh, projects, international projects that we are doing right now. So we have done work earlier with uh, Mexico, Canada, the whole of US, and as Sam was mentioning a little bit earlier that we have done work with uh, uh, Colombia too. All of this work, some of this work has been funded by USAID, but primarily by the Department of Energy, uh, Mexico's uh, CENER, which is Department of Energy for them, and Canada's uh, Natural Resources Canada. And I think we have been greatly blessed to have like all these critical partners uh, helping us uh, work with them to, to incorporate, answer all these research questions, uh, partnering with the utilities on the ground and having worked with them with different research questions and also data. And, and, and I think it's gonna, India is, is I think one of the biggest uh, partners right now. And I think we think it, it's it's uh, we can answer great questions or different various research questions which would be helpful not only for the utility planners but the the city level planners the national level planners and the transmission and operational planners uh, uh, for the state and also as as a nation altogether i think with that i'll pass it over to subtuck Yeah. Um, thanks, Prakash. Sorry, this is Sam oh, again. Uh, <laughs> we had um, we we're planning to go over a little bit of the, the data sources that we're using for GGen, but I want to make sure we leave enough time for subtalk. So I'll, I'll just quickly breeze through some of this, and then I see we're starting to get some questions in in the chat, which is really great. We're trying to save some time for Q and A at the end of it, this too. So maybe we can get into this a little bit more. Um, just to quickly go over here, so in DGEN India, we're modeling uh, a statistical model. So a really great thing about it is the model is we're, we're trying to open source it. It will be available on GitHub and you can scale the number of agents you're modeling to how patient you are and the available computational resources you have. So you don't necessarily need a supercomputer to run this model. And we're able to sample on multiple attributes, such as you know we're sampling based on where the district is, uh, what the solar resource availability is, what the rooftops in that area look like, um, as well as what sector it can be. Uh, and then, last thing I'll go over here is just the various data sources we're using now. I won't walk through this whole table, but I think in the Q and A it would be useful to talk about some of the data sources that we're still looking for. Uh, we, we've one of the interconnections we're having with Crest, and this is a good way to cue in Septoc, is they conducted some detailed LIDAR studies, as I mentioned, and we're sharing some of that data and able to use LIDAR data for, for Bangalore to look at and, and estimate what roofs look like in India. Uh, we're also hoping to get some more detailed 8760s of demand, um, but generally we're using census data and electric power survey data, um, which is, is publicly available um, for India. Um, so great. I will skip ahead. Just the last thing to say is that we are making DGEN available on GitHub. Uh, it is a Python-based model. Um, it requires some knowledge of the command line, um, but as I said, you know, depending how many agents you want to run, you can really scale it from running on your laptop to a, a full-fledged Linux server. Um, we provide entry data and kind of the, the baseline starting data that you need, but then as I mentioned, DGEN really works well when you're running different scenarios. So you, you're free to change that data or to, um, to, to change or modify things and, and compare scenarios. Uh, so currently it's available on GitHub, but it's not made public, um, but we are allowing uh, some people to access it. So please shoot me an email, sam.kobrick at nrl.gov, or we'll show this again at the end, if you are interested in using DGEN and we can get you access to the model and we're, we're happy to do any, you know, day training to, to get you started using it. Um, and with that, I think I can hand it over to Subtok. I'm going to give him the mouse real quick, and he can talk through Crest a little bit.
Subtalk, you might be on mute. Right. Thanks, Sam. Good evening, India. Good morning, North America. So what we wanted to do with the Crest platform was essentially when the 40 gigawatt target was announced and we would work with the Bangalore electricity supply company for a while. So we asked them what their take on the 1.2 gigawatt target for them was and they were like, it's kind of a tall task. And we thought that we first need to understand uh, what the issues are with respect to rooftop solar in India. Um, are the slides forwarded? Because I don't think they are. Well, let me see here. Try now. Um, here, I can just step through yeah. them if, if it's not working. Yeah, yeah. There you it's, go. I think it's working now. Right. So the first, the, so based on a simple survey and uh, some deeper questions with developers revealed that the information that was available for consumers was not the best because uh, they didn't have uh, accurate information regarding how much generation they were getting thanks to no shading analysis being performed. And because of that, they were not getting the right amount of uh, as payback or IRR and the business case was not clear for them. In terms of the DISCOM, because they fear that the high paying consumers, the commercial industrial sector, which is leading the rooftop revolution, if they switch over, then there's a revenue erosion component to it, which is justified. Plus with the, most of the DISCOMs in India having a poor financial health, it becomes a problem for them to accommodate so much of rooftop. And this leads to banks perceiving major risk and only a few programs running through the World Bank or the ADB through local uh, the national banks are available for getting finance. Plus there is also, although there are policies of net metering, but some states don't have, some states allow net metering for some consumer categories. Plus there's an MNRE subsidy which is there, but that is not available again for all consumer categories. So there's a lot of uncertainty and all of these issues don't get clearly explained to the end consumer or the developer who is becoming a resco for the rooftop sector. And last but not the least is that kilowatt systems of rooftop typically cost higher and that leads to again higher rates of tariffs being determined by discoms for feasibility which again would stress on the discom finances. So what we wanted to do with Bescom was understand how we bring down the cost of rooftop through economies of scale. Plus we wanted to get technologies which provide a proper assessment of the rooftop along with the technical and economic aspects considering shadows. And of course, uh, a lot of uh, developers tend to overlook this, but since we are a policy think tank, we have to understand the demands of all stakeholders. So we have to work with the DISCOM to understand what business models suit them and it's not just oriented towards either the consumer or the developers. So we have to make a system which has all the aspects and the opinions of stakeholders in mind. So what we wanted to do is cover the entire city of Bangalore and predetermine which are the best rooftops available for installation and for that we used LiDAR where we covered around uh, 1179 square kilometers and assessed each and every rooftop at a five centimeter resolution. So what that allowed us to do is uh, determine shadows from any obstacle and how they're affecting the insulation, which is incident on each rooftop, and then choose the most suitable area and find out what is the system size, what is the economics, because we also linked Bescom's consumption database to each rooftop and found out what is the business case for each consumer. So there are two uh, aspects to the tool. One is the consumer interface where any consumer can log in and assess the feasibility of installing X kilowatt on their roof. And the other one is to help Bescom make a big tender of around a gigawatt. And for that, we uh, I will come to that later where we show for each subdivision of Bescom, what are the suitable rooftops and what sizes and what size category they belong to. So the outputs of the LIGAR exercise was that we got a three-dimensional 
Uh, this is called a physical surface model. So you can do this either, you, either using LIDAR or using any high quality aerial imagery through photogrammetry. Then we can reconstruct the entire city in the form of points. So you can see this is a reconstructed image. And then we have the ortho image also. And then we do the solar insulation analysis on each of these roofs. So you see the dark red indicates high radiation, whereas yellow indicates lesser radiation incident because of shadows. So quick demo of what the tool can do. So once the consumer logs in with their account ID, it takes them to a vicinity of the location and is it playing? Um, it's not for me. Maybe do you want to try clicking the play button in the lower left? Subtract. I have, so here we go. Right, so the consumer chooses the rooftop. So if this is the roof, uh, it gives the radiation profile at a 50 by 50 centimeter resolution. And based on that, as you can see, each rooftop is divided into polygons of different heights. So they can choose the number of polygons they want to assess the system for. And then you have the best form consumption details, which you can edit in case there are some errors in our projections. And once you do that, it, in that area that we had selected, the tool is going to select the most suitable uh, location based on the radiation profile without shadows, and then give you the best system size, which offsets your consumption completely. So in this case, a six kilowatt system is enough with a payback period of only four years and a pre-tax IRR of 38%. So it gives you how, your, how you make your money back at your fourth year. And it also comes down to, you can also select which day of the year is generating how much power for you but if you are not happy with the way we've selected the size you can always customize it and say i want 10 kilowatt and then you have the best place for 10 kilowatt also but some developers and some people might not like this distributed profile so they might select only a certain part of the rooftop for a selection of or for installation of rooftop pv so as you can see if you draw a polygon on this it will show you what is the required system size to offset your consumption in that particular area with a different CUF because it might be slightly lower than the best area that we chose. So that is where we are with the consumer interface. And now we come to the more uh, relevant part of this discussion with NREL where we divide the city into subdivisions and based on a multi-criteria analysis, we choose the highest ranked systems with more than 18% CUF. So as you can see, there are so many uh, system size categories, 0 to 3, 3 to 10, 10 to 50, and 50 to 2 megawatts. And it gives you all the rooftops in that subdivision with the cumulative capacity. Now, if you click on any of these categories, it will show you all these rooftops mapped. And if you select on any of these roofs, it will show you the exact location of that and the system size and CUF and the capital cost. So this allows us to help BESCOM aggregate all capacities for a large tender. And this is the information that we are helping NREL with because they get to know all the suitable rooftops with the and the unsuitable rooftops along with it, with the total area per roof and the area that can be considered for rooftop solar with a minimum of 18% CUF. Based on that, Uh, Sam, can you help me? Yeah, thanks. So based on that, we are yeah. now helping uh, Descom, uh, Bescom uh, prepare their tender. So the aggregation part is done. We have to do a bit of distribution level load flow studies to see which feeders are getting overloaded and where there is some need of infrastructure upgrade, upgradation. A cost calculation, average cost of supply calculations need to be performed and we've already done that to see which business models are helping Bescom and not leading to a rise in their ACOS. And that is also linked to which Rescom models. So we are launching the tool on the 2nd of September and we invite you all to attend it. And in the meantime, we are collaborating with NREL to now we are expanding to four cities in Madhya Pradesh and six cities in Bihar. And we hope that with a more, because the first attempt that we made, we didn't connect the account ID to each rooftop, whereas in the next 10 cities we will. 
and that is going to lead to a much more richer database which we will then work with NREL and find out how DGEN can apply them in the Indian context and get to a much better state in terms of data. That is all from my side and we think now we'll get to the questions. Thanks, Aptak. Thanks, Sam. Great. I think uh, let me uh, let, let me collate the questions and bring it to you. I think one of the questions that we got is, uh, uh, I think that's for Sam. Can you mention some of the challenges associated in modeling Indian renewable energy scenarios? And that's from Asad. Yeah, uh, thank you, Asad. Um, one of the, the biggest challenges we've had so far in India is just getting scenario specific data. And so typically three scenarios that we always model are um, PV cost projection at low, mid and high. In the US, we base that off of NREL puts out an annual report of annual technology baseline, um, which provides a cost projection through 2050 of, of solar. Um, we have gotten some market data for India, um, which is useful, but there's other scenarios we're interested in modeling too. For instance, moving from net metering to net billing, or uh, you know, if consumption drastically increases with you know widespread adoption of air conditioners, or or things like that. And so, really, it's getting that scenario-specific data, which is typically the most difficult. The other thing is, as I said, we have that mass diffusion curve, and so. Remember, I, I brought up those two variables, or maybe you don't remember, but we have a, a P and a Q variable, and we tune those, we need to tune those before running the model based on historical adoption data. And so it's really getting good historical adoption data with enough granularity that we can tune that at scale. And so Paratash, as you were mentioning, trying to move from projecting at the state level down to the, the district level. Um, those are all things that are, are going to be really key in order for us to do that. But NREL is definitely interested in partnering with other entities, other utilities. Um, a, a partnership with CSTEP has been very good so far and has provided a lot of data. Um, we're, we're trying to make this tool open source and useful for everyone. So uh, if you are a utility or a power sector planner or someone else who think you could use DGEN and potentially have some useful data, we're definitely interested in partnering and, and seeing uh, what challenges we can overcome together. Thanks, Sam. I think uh, one of the comments that we got from Debajit from Terry, New Delhi, is I think they have also developed a GIS-based model for rooftop solar potential for the city of Chandigarh. And I think that's something like uh, CSEF, CSEF has done for Bangalore, and uh, uh, we should definitely talk with them and look into like the, the Chandigarh-specific rooftop potentials and how do they match up with uh, what we have right now in the model. So thanks, Debajit. Uh, I think the next question is from, uh, what would be the biggest advantage over of DGEN over Homer? That's I think for Sam. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not super familiar with Homer, but from what I understand, it's more like, um, uh, we have a, a model, a comparable model here at NRL called system advisor model which is you know you you're looking at developing a specific system in a specific area and you want to know more about that specific system where the advantage of dgen is we model you know hundreds of thousands of systems or or even more um for each each agent we model in every year 10 different system configurations um or more and so dgen is looking like really high level uh but modeling out of uh, at a, a bottom-up perspective so we're modeling tons of different systems picking the best one and then aggregating those results together to simulate what a realistic market can look like my understanding of homer is they don't um go into as much detail with the the uh i mean they don't take such a high level perspective to look at what adoption looks like over an entire geography they're more focused on what an, an individual system can do um I think that's what Homer's yeah. doing. Yeah, I would just add to that that Homer is primarily a site-specific uh, advantage that that you can get like site-specific study, but I think DGen gives you an overall, as I was mentioning, an overall picture of uh, of particular state or a particular utility aggregated up. So it's a combination of different stuff, but it's a statistical modeling. So it combines the or the total load or the different total load of different sectors within a particular state or within a particular utility customer's base. 
but homework I think looks at site specific ones for a particular building or a particular location. What's the idle PV system size or a combination of different technologies? How do I size my system, which is beneficial for my building or my, my customer base? Uh, I think the next question, uh, can you please explain the interaction of DGEN, REITs, and Plexos? Uh, I think Sam, you can take a first track of it and I'll add to it if needed. Yeah, absolutely. So REITs is, uh, and I work on the India REITs model as well. So what REITs is doing is doing capacity expansion at the utility scale. So that's based on current planning uh, by CEA and others, uh, what the power system will look like in terms of utility scale generation from coal plants, natural gas, as well as renewables, uh, and what that interaction looks like. Um, Plexos is then doing production cost modeling, so assigning that capacity that's built by reeds and actually trying to understand what the market looks like and what dispatch looks like um, and how power plants perform from a, an individual site revenue perspective. DGEN is kind of like reeds, but it's focused purely on distributed uh, resources. So how does rooftop PV do? Um, how is how does uh, you know rooftop or, or behind the meter storage uh, perform? Um, but DGEN, uh, in the US at least, we DGEN's outputs are used as an input for reads. We're not doing that yet for India, but we should start doing that soon. Thanks, Sam. Uh, I think uh, we got another question. I think this is maybe for Shoptak and Sam all, both together. Are there plans to extend uh, this tool in Rajasthan and Gujarat, which has high solar insulation? Uh, Shoptak tool? can speak about uh, Sata can speak about Crest, like you talked about like the 10 or 12 cities that you were planning. Does that uh, cover Rajasthan right, or Gujarat right now? Unfortunately, at the moment, we are uh, going only to Madhya Pradesh and Bihar because uh, we were approached by both of these states. But I would uh, love to have Crest for Rajasthan and Gujarat, if the opportunity comes along. So in case Asad has any leads on that, we are very willing to pursue them. Yeah, absolutely. Just to add to that, I, I think um, we're trying to bridge the gap a little bit where DGEN is really a national level model and, and Crest is a, you know, a site specific um, modeling LIDAR that then kind of aggregates it. We're trying to bridge that gap and, and model more cities in final ref resolution in DGEN. Um, so as it stands now, they kind of are, are separate models, but if more data became available and we're seeking out additional funding opportunities um, from, from grants and foundations and the US government uh, to potentially extend this to other cities and perform, conduct more LIDAR studies and then also be able to use that data for both Crest and DGEN and further integrate the two models together. Thanks, Sam. I think uh, one more question. Can you speak more about how DGEN is performing validation exercises using CSEP's uh, data or data the, tool, the data that we got from CSEP for Bangalore? Yes. Yeah, so so as I mentioned, the, the two models are pretty separate right now in the results. Um, I think because, you know, best, uh, Crest is just a Bangalore specific model right now and is being extended to those cities mentioned by Subtac, um, DGEN is a national model. And so uh, the results aren't necessarily compatible. However, we are using the same rooftop data. We're finding rooftop data is actually one of our hardest uh, steps usually. And so we're really uh, grateful that Crest has been able to provide us great rooftop data for Bangalore, and we're using that as, as our baseline, more or less, for uh, what we're simulating all rooftops look like in India. So the rooftop characteristics and some of the aging characteristics that CSTEP's using is also being integrated into the DGEN model. Uh, the next one is from, I don't have the name, but uh, are you planning to have a GUI-based uh, platform for for these, are they going to be Python based? Is there is there a GUI coming, or is it just Python based uh, application right now? <laughs> Paratosh, you should handle that one. <laughs> right now, it's it's Python based. It's mostly uh, mostly a technical specific uh, one. So you need a couple of uh, uh, a little bit of technical skills to 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 run the model. But it's it uses an Excel based input sheet. So basically, to set up 
all your scenarios and stuff is done on on a Excel sheet, to, but it's translated back to to code within it, which runs on the background. But to make it more user friendly, I think a uh, lot of work is going on right now to make it more user friendly, so a lot of other people can adopt it and use it more more frequently. But right now, it's it's a Python based model. But but I think in future, it's yeah. it's looking great. It's it's more work is going on currently to make it better. Yeah, and, and just to re, um, clarify, that's for DGen. Uh, Crest C Steps Crest tool has a, a GUI. It's a web app, and it's it's very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, one more question from Sandhya: How can a utility use these different tools for IIP purposes? How does it feed into each other? Yeah, um, I think I can take the first part from DGen. Say DGen is good there, at, as I said, running different scenarios. So if a utility in their IRP usually will have multiple scenarios, such as you know, what happens if we have to raise tariffs, or what happens if uh, um, you know we change from net metering to net billing, or what if cross subsidization ends and suddenly electricity becomes more uh, expensive for residential customers or agricultural customers have to start paying more for electricity or paying for electricity. Those are questions that you should be answering in your IRP and that DGEN can definitely help answer. Um, we, you can run all those different scenarios and then see how the different cumulative adoption curves uh, look based on the scenario and, and also, you know, what are kind of the micro data patterns? Like maybe if you end net metering, you see a lot more adoption in one area, but you see it in others and in other scenarios. Um, that's from the DGEN perspective. I think uh, I'll hand it over to Subtalk who can maybe answer that from the Crest perspective. Um, with respect to the IRP purposes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And maybe how you're doing tenders. Right. So from what, so the tendering process is a bit different because uh, we have to figure out what are the consumer category shares of each roof? So maybe 200 megawatts for domestic, 300 for industrial, and remaining on RESCO models. So when we combine all of that, what does BESCOM's final rooftops, uh, the whole system look like? And whether that is feeding into their RPOs, how much of it is there is going into their RPO, whereas how much of it goes to the states uh, in the captive consumption RPO. So all of that is another study which is going on, but it is not part of the CREST tool per se, but that was part of the SIF work that we were doing. So that is where we are at these questions. So it doesn't necessarily feed into each other, but the outputs of CREST in terms of choosing the rooftops and then using the economic analysis to determine the business models, that is the only link between the two. I would just add, like, for IRP purposes, I think at least on the DGEN side, uh, it definitely helps in the bulk power system planning and combination with bulk power system planning with uh, the, these distributed resources, how these these uh, resources interact with each other for uh, future different scenarios, different load growths, different load projections that they have, different resources that they are uh, that they have planned to come online in a in couple of years. How does those interact with these goals? Uh, those would definitely help. Uh, I think uh, one thing that we are missing right now is the storage behind the meter storage piece, which we are not considering right now, but I think is an important factor going forward to achieve those uh, bigger goals, uh, renewable energy goals for 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 India. Uh, and I think we are planning to look into more and more as as we improve the model into more granular granularity and uh, with more data. I think we are just out of time. Uh, I, I'll leave over to Sam for and Sam and Saptak for their end comments. Yeah, um, I guess just two things to finish on is your, our emails are here. Um, please contact Subtalk if you have any questions about the Crest tool or you want to potentially use it um, or, or see some sort of utilization there for, for your utility or area. Uh, please, please contact myself or Peritosh if you are interested in the DGEN model. Um, we are uh, quite interested in partnering with additional utilities or areas uh, or, or, or entities that can provide data. Um, and we're, we're seeking out additional funding opportunities internally, so we potentially can provide a lot of results um, uh, and no cost to you. 
Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is we have another webinar planned in this, this uh, modeling series, the India Modeling Spotlight series. It is on the Renewable Energy Potential Model, or REV, um, here developed at NREL. Uh, REV is really good at determining where new solar and wind energy projects, so utility scales, should be sited. Um, and it, it follows a similar kind of methodology to DGEN where it looks at technical potential and then breaks it down to economic potential and constructs supply curves at various locations. It's a really cool model and they're also open sourcing it for India. Um, and so it would be great to attend if you enjoyed this talk. Um, Saptak, hand it over to you for the last word. All right, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak at this event and uh, the opportunity or the scope for collaboration between NREN and C-STEP is massive because as we have discussed multiple times before, there are many areas of improvement for the CREST tool in, and we're trying to do that for the other states or cities that we're going for. And anybody on this uh, call or the audience who thinks that their cities are also worth looking at, please do drop me a message and we'll try and see how we can take it forward because now we don't use lidar with helicopters or airplanes anymore and we just use drones it's simpler easier and the permission process is much more streamlined so that's where we are at and we look forward to working with NREL further in the future and any questions that any of you guys have you can please mail them to me Great, I think thanks everyone. Uh, thanks, Saptak, thanks Sam for, for, for this wonderful presentation and thanks uh, everyone back in India and, and in the US for joining. And as, as both of them mentioned, uh, any questions, any information that you want to need, uh, you need, you need from us or any, any collaborations or any research questions that you think would be helpful that we are not answering right now, any feedback, suggestions, I think we would, we would be glad to have them with us and work on them. I think thanks everybody and you guys have a good evening or good morning. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.